my guest today is Jeremiah Tower. Now, rather than coming up with something clever to say about him, I'll just let Anthony Bourdain do it, where he said, Jeremiah Tower made a complete reevaluation of not just American food and ingredients, but food. Jeremiah began his culinary career in 1972 as co-owner and executive chef of Chez Panisse in Berkeley, California. He then continued as executive chef and sole owner of Stars in San Francisco, one of the highest grossing, most innovative and profitable restaurants in the United States. After Stars, he opened restaurants in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Manila. Jeremiah is an award-winning chef, author, keynote speaker, architecture aficionado, and a fantastic podcast guest. He's also the subject of The Last Magnificent, a CNN feature-length documentary film produced by Anthony Bourdain, now on Netflix. I asked Jeremiah to be on the show to talk about his ideas around leadership and where young hoteliers of the world should be focused on pushing our industry forward. It was truly a pleasure to have him on the show and to learn from one of the greats. So let's get to it. This is episode 33 of the Proven Principles podcast, Jeremiah Tower on leadership. Enjoy. Jeremiah, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for inviting me, Adam. This is going to be fun. I think this is going to be fun. Hey, so for people who aren't entrenched in the food and beverage world, sure. or people that haven't seen your Netflix uh, documentary, um, why don't you give everybody a rundown of who Jeremiah Tower is? Well, uh, let's see. Starting, I graduated from Harvard Architecture School thinking that I was, you know, the next world genius in underwater architecture, not knowing that nobody cared about it and still don't, you know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I ended up in San Francisco and I was running out of money. And the friends of mine, actually my ex-roommate at, at Harvard, had said, look at this ad in the paper. And it was an ad from Chez Panisse saying, you know, we're looking for uh, a chef, a head chef. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, so what? That's nothing to do with me. I, I'm not a chef. And uh, but then I got down to twenty five dollars and I thought, well, maybe I should try and be a chef. <laughs> so I did that for five or six years at Chez Panisse. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to a couple one, the Balboa Cafe in San Francisco and the. Uh, uh, oh, my God, what am I trying to say? Santa Fe Bar and Grill in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And then I opened my dream restaurant in San Francisco called Stars. Mm -hmm. And then ran that for 10 years or something. I sold it to a, an Asian group in 2000. And the rest is history. <laughs> As it were. And, and then we made the documentary called The Last Magnificent, which is a very right. embarrassing title, but a great one if you want to you know, sell a movie. Yeah, sure enough. Yeah, it gets people to click. I guess that's what it's all yeah. about these days. Yeah. But uh, yeah. it's really well done. Um, so... The whole reason I wanted to have you on the show, uh, I mean, aside from, uh, you know, speaking with you and getting your take on what's going on in the industry these days was your, your background in building these high performing teams and world renowned restaurants doesn't happen by accident. And I think a, a piece that at least in hospitality that gets a lot of lip service, but not much um, not much effort put into the practice of his leadership. Everybody likes to talk about being a great leader. Everybody likes to talk about building high-performing teams, but the, the, when it comes down to actually doing it, um, it seems to be a skill that isn't very well. Um, uh, it's just not, it's not common. Um, and so in looking at that in looking at leadership and building high successful teams or highly functional teams, what are some of the things that you went into or that you learned through the process of, you know, starting at Chez Panisse, for example, like going in with, you know, little commercial cooking experience and having to get a team rally around you? How do you go into an environment like that and say, okay, I'm the chef and, you know, yes, you should follow me because of my title, but really I need you to follow me because you want to. Um, how do you... Maybe can you kind of walk us through a little bit about your philosophy there? Sure. And at Shape Inith, I have to say there were two of us in the kitchen, you know, so there was no team in the very beginning. And I had uh, my sous chef was a cocaine snorting uh, English po nuclear powered mint sucking drummer, <laughs> <laughs> beatnik drummer. So, you know, he would draw chalk marks on the soup pot and say, make soup to here tonight. That this is how many people we're going to serve. Mm -hmm. So we went from there to four people in the kitchen 
as you can see in the documentary Jean-Pierre Moulet, who became a sous chef. Um, but really, I mean, what leadership works when you can do every job that everyone else has. You don't have to do it better, but you have to at least look like you know you're doing it better. Mm -hmm. uh, and and a, and a few select ones you should do better. At stars, you know, on a Friday night, I would pray that the ladies' room drains or toilet would back up or that, you know, a light bulb over the best table in the house would go out mm -hmm. because then I would drag uh, two bus boys and they'd get a ladder in the middle of, you know, 200 people in the dining room and 50 people waiting. I mean, madness mm -hmm. on a Friday night. We would drag that thing out and I would climb up the ladder and change the light bulb, much to everybody's absolute amazement and applause. They'd all stand up and give me a, a standing ovation, you know. Yeah. I would think that's I just need a little bit of theater like that mm -hmm. to lead the staff and to lead the public. So you're leading the public too. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting way to put it. I mean, I, I, I can hear you. As you're explaining that story, I can think of times when I was in hotels where, um, you know, you might be working at the front desk and somebody needs help with luggage and you run out and you grab it and you put it on a bell cart and you wheel it down to their room. And it's really no big deal to do it, but because of the position that you hold and, you know, the white jacket always has you right. know, so much um, uh, mystique around it, or, you know, you're wearing a suit behind the front desk and people just, they, they, yeah, they gravitate towards that. They uh, they appreciate the effort when someone in a senior position comes and does something that might be seen as below their their position. But really, at the end of the day, you as a leader, yeah, you have to be able to do everything. You have to be willing to do everything and jump in. Right, right. Enjoy it. I mean, all those people, all those managers who think that certain tasks are beneath them. You know, that's not that's the opposite of hospitality. Mm -hmm. And hosp the secret to hospitality great hospitality is there isn't ever a no you know you you say yes and then you turn around and say and now what the fuck am i going to do you know, <laughs> with a smile right right I mean, right one one night at stars i mean we're packed i mean the, you couldn't move there were so many people there were 50 people waiting an hour and a half for the on the waiting list and this couple came in and said like a table and i explained that to them i said you know if i were going to get you a table i'd have to build one and they said fine so I grabbed two busboys, we ran to the basement, we found a tabletop and a table bottom, we screwed them together and brought it up. And I said, but there's no place to put it. As the busboys are holding this table in the air, mm -hmm. I said, but as you see, there's no place to put it. I mean, I would have to put it here, right in the middle of the reception area. And yeah. they said, fine, fine. So we put it there, we got a tablecloth, the busboy set the table and I said, you're here now, but there's no one to serve you. I would have to serve you. And they said, fine. <laughs> <laughs> but you know they're telling that story to this day. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but that's those moments, right? Those those are the 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 times that you crave in the industry to try to I mean, you created raving fans by doing that. Right. 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 And, and, and and countless times otherwise you you did the same thing. Like Jim Nasik is at the Stanford Court Hotel in mm -hmm. uh, San Francisco. I mean, the, it was not a glamorous hotel, but it was an impeccable hotel because of Jim Nasikas, who, you know, again, would change a light bulb himself. Or it's uh, an amazing attention to detail without any arrogance, without any concept that there is no in that mm -hmm. hotel. It was a wonderful place. And I guess that the crux of the whole point is that if your team knows that you are totally willing to do that thing yourself, right? then that's going to make them ide hopefully more willing to do the things, to maybe have integrity in their job, to do the things that need to get done when no one's around to praise them for it. Right. To just do it right. because it's the right thing to do. Exactly. Because that's the culture of the place. You know, how many times these days, particularly, well, before the pandemic anyway, in the United States, you could go into a hotel and you knew and it felt dead. It's because there was no manager. You could go through the reception area and the foyer and the dining and the bar everywhere. There's no manager. Or if there is a manager, he's just standing or she's standing around looking, you know, avoiding everybody's eyes so they don't get caught yep. with something that a customer needs. The whole point of success of hospitality is a culture of hospitality that comes down from the main person, mm -hmm. you know, so that every manager is imbued with a passion 
that the owner, and of course, when the owner is a group uh, out of uh, Russia or something, mm -hmm. that's a little bit difficult. Cultural differences and, and maybe uh, different priorities in the business. Not just cultural ones, but I mean, if it's, a, you know, the offices are on the 40th floor mm -hmm. of uh, Hong Kong or New York, um, it's a little difficult for the staff to relate to. For mm -hmm. instance, a group like Hillstone in the United States, that amazing restaurant group, mm -hmm. where they were almost vaccinated with the owner's culture. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. The, you know, recently in Los Angeles, I was at a hotel and I walked in to the reception and there was one person there and she looked at me and said, you have to wait. Well, of course I have to wait. I don't expect, uh, you know, the old days in Hong Kong when you your key was in your room and you were taken up there. And right. since they already had a credit card, they didn't make you wait in line just to produce your credit card for, for mm -hmm. God's sakes. And I said, I waited a few minutes and I said, was well, anyone who could help me? And she said, I told you, you have to wait. Oh God. This wow. was a Four Seasons hotel. Oh my gosh. And yeah. I just yeah. thought, wow. <laughs> wow, have we really come to that? Because yes. it's, it's the me, me, me generation has it ruined. Mm -hmm. often. Yeah, sense of entitlement. Um, and that permeates into, into the jobs. It's about, you know, it, it's coming at it from a perspective that the guest or the customer gets in the way of me being able to do my job. Right, exactly. I mean, I was, uh, you know, the last person she wanted to see was a customer standing in front of her. Well, yeah, because I have a checklist to do and I have, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A and, break to you know, take. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it may come as a huge surprise to a lot of people working in the hospitality industry, industry but, you know, it's not about you. Mm -hmm. Almost nothing is about you. It's the true. About, it, go ahead. The only thing about you is that you, you're doing your job beautifully and enjoying it. Yeah, you know, that's... Uh, those, the people that maybe have a different view of it are the ones that tend to get weeded out along the way. But there may be some casualties, uh, you know, bad reviews or whatever, sure. while those people eventually realize that the job just isn't for them. This is just not the industry that, that they're meant to do. I mean, smiling at 300 people a day and, and you know, as if you're the, the first person they want to see and That's right. you're thrilled to see them. Yep. And then, but you have to sort of believe that too. It can't be fake. You're definitely not the 300th person today to ask me where the bathroom is. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I was, uh, took my dinner, my staff to dinner at Harry Cipriani in New York. It was after one of the Meals on Wheels. It was pretty late. We didn't have a chance to go back and change. I had, you know, a blazer on, so uh, they couldn't quite see how dirty my whites were. I mean, there were practically flies buzzing around our heads. We were so smelly. <laughs> But, you know, it was the summer and we'd been working for all day up until 10.30, mm -hmm. 11 o'clock at night. We went in and they made, I said to my staff, everyone get behind me. I'm the one that was, you know, vaguely presentable. Uh, so the maitre d' came out and said, oh, I'm terribly sorry. We couldn't even get in. You know, we're fully booked. I said, I saw Harry Cipriani behind him and I caught his eye. He came over and he did the most amazing training of hospitality I'd ever seen. He didn't say a word to his maitre d' or staff, he sat us, and then Harry served my food himself without a word. And the huh. staff were just agog. I mean, yeah. oh my God. But he never yelled at them or anything. He just mm -hmm. did lead the by job example. that they should lead by example. Yeah, man. It's, it's, you know, there's... There's so many examples in my career where I've I've seen that happen and, and where I eventually emulate those managers that did those things, right? So it's it was this, you know, that's the behavior that I saw was not just uh, made you successful in the industry and not just like because it was a brand standard and not just because Forbes told you to do it. It was it was about it always ended up coming back down to leadership. There was a, a moment I remember in my career when I became a supervisor. And I, I, I realized over a series of uh, kind of trial and error, like making a lot of mistakes in suddenly leading a shift um, where my success was largely dependent on getting other people to do their jobs. It was done, my success was predicated 
through other people. Um, and that trial and error of making mistakes and, and, you know, making people upset and probably, you know, getting hauled down to HR every handful of times, uh, because saying the wrong thing, uh, but eventually coming out of it, realizing like, oh no, that's, it's not about me. This, this idea of servant leadership, um, really does work. And right. I wonder if I hope that as we come out of this pandemic, that that mentality permeates the industry a lot more because it's, it's, you see it in pockets, but by and large, it's definitely missing. Right. It's still command and control. Yes. Yes. I mean, the, the I think the pandemic was going to happen to the hospitality industry all by itself, mm -hmm. not the disease, but the, uh, you know, the margins in restaurants were getting so small and the attitude of hospitality was changing to, to the absolute in the hotels mm -hmm. Um, so I think it was going to happen anyway. It, this is very painful. It's a worldwide apocalypse, um, but we have to crawl out of it. We do. And make it Run better. out of it and make it better. And this is a huge opportunity. After the plague, you know, the Black Death in Europe became the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. um, an awful lot of people died, but then, you know, then we had Michelangelo and Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. Absolutely. Yeah. So much beauty came out of it. So many, and then you know, I, I keep talking about this, you know, again and again. I, I, I sound like a bit of a broken record, but out of two thousand eight, two thousand nine, we saw titanic shifts in gig economy, and you know, uh, Airbnb eventually came out of that, which was a titanic shift in in the hotel yes. industry. Yes. There's no doubt that there's somebody working on something right now that is going to completely revolutionize hospitality and we just we can't see around that corner yet but it's happening right right i mean it has to it has to i mean uh, seven hundred thousand hotels in the world you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly it's got to give yeah yeah uh when you when you take a step back and you look at the industry as a whole um you know you, the monday morning quarterback it a little bit what would you like to see change in hospitality what's what is it within the culture that may be broken that we need to start to move towards fixing what's that piece of advice you give to the the young supervisor or the young manager to help them you know pull this direction this, this industry kicking and screaming in a new direction it's very important for to know what perfection is in hospitality whether it's a restaurant or a hotel it's impossible to know that if you haven't experienced it. If you're going to work for a group, find a group that is enlightened and wealthy enough to say, okay, you're going to go spend a night at the Four Seasons in New York um, and follow the whole experience. And then you're going to come back and tell us from the time you first called them or made a reservation or how you met a reservation and you flew in. With any luck, you would have traveled for 20 hours before you get there because that's a real test mm -hmm. of you and, and them. And then it, up until you're in a cab or a limo leaving, you know, the next day or two days later. If it's perfect, if it's like, for instance, the Georges Sank in Paris or the Four Seasons in, in New York, mm -hmm. um, you'll learn everything you need to know. If you're paying attention, if you're inspecting it, you know, what is your experience, let alone all of that? What is just the experience in the bathroom? Mm -hmm. Is there a place to hang your bathrobe? All that kind of stuff. There should be a checklist in your mind. So when you're a top manager or a manager or a trainee or an owner, that checklist is in your mind revolving all day, night long mm -hmm. as you manage your hotel. And it's a blessing and a curse. You, 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 you have it, but when you have it, you can't turn it off. Well, you better be obsessive or, or you know, go do something else. <laughs> That's true. I, I'll never forget the. I had an executive housekeeper early in my career that used to inspect the bathroom by sitting on the toilet. Yes, yes. And you so can't you just could, walk around like no, a housekeeper you, with a clipboard. Excuse me. Yeah. You have to sleep in that room. You know, all of you listening. You know, if you if you want to know, read the a couple of biographies of Cesar Ritz. Oh yes. Absolutely. Who was so obsessive and so knowledgeable that you know he, his brains collapsed when he was forty-five? Yeah. Uh, just blew his the brains blew themselves out. <laughs> this is a man who, when they opened the Ritz in Paris, 
had every single napkin unfolded and folded in front of him, every single one. He tried out every single mattress. I mean, okay, that's going a little far, but Excessive. there was no no in Cesar Ritz's life. And mm -hmm. his partnership with Escoffier, the chef, uh, was amazing. Somebody said to them once, I think it was at the, one of the hotels in London, they had the Prince of Wales for dinner in one place and somebody else in another one. And there was a Grand Duke of Russia who came in late and said, I would like, you know, the private, whatever private dining room. And Ritz said, I'm sorry, you know, there's uh, actually, they're all taken. And he, he said, but, you know, we have the basement. We can flood it and freeze it and do a winter wonderland for you. And that's what they did for the Grand Duke of Russia. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> yeah, talk about thinking on your feet. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, you know, yes, and now what the fuck am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, ultimately, you, you, yeah, you're trying to create or solve a problem and you end up creating a whole new problem that uh, right. you, got, you have right. to fix to make it better. Um, but that's hospitality. That's hospitality, though. That's what it is. And that's the that's the drug. That's the intoxication of it is that right. Is, right. is the the instant gratification of figuring something out and seeing it play out in front of you right away. Right away. Yeah, yeah. The smiles and and um, are there any questions that we're not asking in hospitality right now? Well, I mean, there's so there's just one big question. I mean, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. um, this thing is going to go on a long time. It's going to wipe out uh, a lot of very good people. Um, the question is, you know, what can we build and how can we build it? My idea is it such a huge problem that I was reading the other day on Nation's Restaurant News and also I heard on CNBC or something that, you know, between March and May, uh, American billionaires uh, made $434 billion more yeah. in that little period. Bezos got 34, Zuckerberg got 25 billion just in that three months and it's December. So, you know, I think those figures are probably huge. So, my point is think of all the chips, the computers, the reservation system, the computers, everything it takes to run a hotel, let alone 700,000 of them around the world. Right. Um, and if you add up all, I think it's annually, you know, between the restaurants and hotels, it's $1.7 trillion annually. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I want to say to Silicon Valley, Microsoft and all this, Intel, everybody, it's payback time. Yeah. You've just made hundreds of billions of dollars off of us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, because we love the things you've done for the hospitality industry. But, you know, we pay, how much is a POS system in a, in a 200 seat restaurant these days in the United States? Mm -hmm. Huge, 50 grand or Huge. something. I mean, Huge. yeah. Yeah. So you could be, yeah, you could be paying $10,000 a, a room for a PMS system at a hotel. Yeah, there you go. And you've yeah. got 200 rooms. So mm -hmm. it's payback time. We need an Einstein moment. You know, we need the moment that when Google went through somebody's brain, when Amazon went through Jeff Bezos' brain, uh, he actually came to me in 1984 or five and said, I've mm -hmm. got this idea. Would you do a, a, a you know, TV section for us? Mm -hmm. I said, well, I listened to what he had to say. I thought it was the stupidest idea I ever heard. Now, you know? He offered me stock. I said, no, you're a good customer. I don't, you know, need that. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, man. But we need one of those moments, you know, the, an Einstein moment when the universe changes. And we, we don't just need the money. We need the brains. And I think, you know, if they gave $100 billion and gave, you know, $4 billion to 25 countries and set up a competition, I don't... Don't look at governments. They're a pandemic all by themselves, you know. <laughs> I mean, they're just useless and, and uh, not any good, unless you're in Sweden and they're paying you your salary. But put a competition, give $4 billion to 25 countries and say, come up with a solution and have, a, have an international panel of the best hotelier and hospitality people. Uh, you know, I mean, ask Mary Gostelow in England. Oh, She'll yeah. tell you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it'll take that kind of impact. It's going to like a meteor impact to get this done. 
Yeah, I think that's such a good idea. You know, we we have to get away. And I, you know, I straddle both worlds. I, I understand the investment side of it. I understand the people that put up the millions of dollars in some cases to buy and maintain a property. Right. But I also, you know, I came up through operations. I started as a pot washer and worked my way up eventually to being a, a VP of operations. And it, you know, it took 25 years, but it happened. Uh, and so I, I see what happens in the unsexy parts of the hotel, the people that, that are the ones that craft those experiences, the ones that work in departments that most people don't even know exist. And, you know, and what they go through every day, You're taking the train two hours each way to go to work and making, you know, not a lot of money. No. Um, and, and, you know, I still don't know how to square that. I don't know how you meet the needs of both sides. And I think you're right. That's, this is, this is the thing that we need to be thinking about is how do you make sure that, you know, there's a place to go back to work too, but that the people that are the ones that are making the money in the building and, and crafting those great experiences um, are well taken care of. I think it's time that uh, not just the people with not very much money are making the sacrifices. It's time for everybody to make sacrifices. Uh, it's being forced on us anyway. But the thing is, I'm hoping that this pandemic cures some of the massive greed mm. that has become the culture uh, in the United States and around the world. Um, come on, you got you billionaires, just take a little less money. You, you're worth $150 billion. Mm -hmm. And your hotel operations could, could make $1 billion less every year. Fine. Fine. Right. Right. Fine, Microsoft. Spend a billion dollars and improve your, your, your software that hasn't been upgraded in decades. You know, I mean, <laughs> stop the greed. Stop right. the greed. Right. And then it'll all balance out. Spend some money on training. Take your staff your, uh, and put them up in a great hotel for a night and let them see what it all means. Yep. Little less return on the bottom line for, you know, the 1%. And uh, this could be relieved. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, you make a really good point. There's a lot of industries that are recruiting away hospitality professionals because they possess a certain skill that you don't get in a lot of other industries. It's, you know, the relatability and the, and the, um, the caring and the willingness to go above and beyond and, and think on your feet and fix problems for people because it's the right thing to do, not because it's, you know, because your manager tells you to do it. Um, and that's, you know, turn, turn that mirror around and, and help the industry that is providing the services and the people that are getting pulled out of it to benefit other industries. I think it's, I think you make an excellent point and, uh, you know, stop recruiting chefs to go work for Google in the, yeah. in the food hall, <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, right. you know, that kind of thing, make it, make the restaurant in the hotel a place that is a, you can have a viable career. So, you know, we've all seen what those banquet waiters are like at a mid-range hotel like Sheraton or something, and you go to one of those big charity banquets, and the, those banquet waiters, union banquet waiters are just, oh, God, I mean, you know, I, I want to shoot myself every time I see them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Eat anyway, I won't go into, you know, you know what I'm saying. I know what you're saying. But the hospitality industry, most of the workers, I mean, there's a great work ethic Mm -hmm. You know, and they want to be doing something fantastic. So fund that, train them. You know, I took uh, a couple of my chefs to the Paris uh, for a weekend. We went to the Creon because I wanted to show them the breakfast service, mm -hmm. which was the most perfect service in the world that I knew of, apart from the right. region of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, and then I took them a couple of restaurants, but I wanted them to see the Creon. Mm -hmm. At breakfast, and then we flew back, and they were, you know, they were never the same again. The stars, never. stars took a couple of leaps up. Yep, yep. And it was that because you're willing to, to, you know, this thought just came to mind. I mean, it, it's not just about creating experiences for paying customers. You're creating these 
these experiential moments to learn and expand horizons for your team right. to elevate the offering that is being put out there to your customers. And so really it doesn't matter who you're talking to as a leader, you, you want to create experiences for people because it's those experiences that create the emotional connections to whatever it is that you're trying the message you're trying to get out there. And that's when those transformative moments happen. I think that's, that's a, that's pretty powerful. And also you get the money back. I got that money back because when the two chefs came back, they told everybody, all the rest of the staff were dying to hear what it was like, you know, mm -hmm. and then that sort of set up a com competition uh, amongst the staff to come up with ideas, you know, to improve stars. And if they gave me an idea and I liked it and they said, well, you know, so-and-so in New York is doing that. I'd say, well, let's go to New York and find out. If totally. And you get that money back because when you walk in, when the public walks in, they, they feel that incre that frisson, that excitement. That's worth yeah. a lot more money than a three zeros on a, on a bottom line. A hundred percent. Totally agree. Um, Jeremiah, before we wrap the show, uh, I wanted to just get your uh, perspective on what the young hotelier, the young cook, the person right. who's in culinary school right now, the person who's in hotel management school right now, looking at our industry, wondering if they made the right choice to put their time and their money into getting an education in this field right now, thinking to themselves, maybe this isn't a viable career option for me anymore because of everything that we've talked about today. Um, what would be your message to them if you could kind of stand in front of the class and tell them what to look forward to in what it is that we do? There's never been a more frightening, horrible time. I mean, this is an apocalypse, but it's also there's never been a better time for something absolutely amazing to happen. And you, all of you, I would tell them, are the architects of this. You know, you are the designers. Pick it up, pick up the problems, pick yourselves up and make something brilliant out of it. You know, there are, in the USA, there are a million restaurants, uh, 700,000, as I say, hotels worldwide. That's not going away. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of places might close, but they're all the customers who, are you, who want hotels and restaurants. They're not going to suddenly say overnight, oh, I'm, I'm just giving up hotel, my hotel experience and my restaurant experience. That's not going to happen. So it's up to everybody in the hospitality industry to uh, realize that their future is one for them, all of them to create. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the chef who lost his restaurant and was telling me the other day, but he went out and did a coffee cart. You know? And I said, okay, well, that's how empires are built. Mm -hmm. It's so true. There's so many offshoots in that. That's one of the best things about this industry is that it's so broad. You right. can still be involved in it in many different facets, just because you're not a front office manager or an executive housekeeper or hotel GM doesn't mean you can't be connected to it in some way. And I think that's what this whole thing has illuminated is that just be creative. Be creative and, and be engaged in it. It's no longer, I'll just show up and go to work and then, you know, punch out my card and then leave. Um, that's not going to work anymore. And the greed at the top is not going to work anymore. Couldn't have said it better myself. Great. <laughs> Jeremiah, this was, this was fantastic. Thank you again Thank for you. being on the show. If people want to get a hold of you or learn more about you, what's the best place for them to go? My email, jeremiahtower at gmail.com. Okay. Perfect. Easy. I'll link to it in the show notes. Okay. All Wonderful. Right. Thanks again, Jeremiah. Talk Thank you. you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. This was my episode with Jeremiah Tower. You can get in touch with him at jeremiahtower at gmail.com. You can see the full interview on YouTube. Just search the Proven Principles Podcast. And you can learn more about the show on our website, theprovenprinciplespodcast.com. Finally, if you need help with a business strategy or just need someone to work with on a tough problem in your hotel or restaurant, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can book a free call with me by going to knowinghospitality.com slash contact. Thanks again for listening. Until next time. For past episodes, show notes, or if you've got a story that might make a great episode, head on over to theprovenprinciplespodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. 
You can subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts, even on YouTube. And if you haven't already, don't forget to leave us a rating and a review. Thanks for listening to the Proven Principles Podcast.